Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to start out with our feature tonight, Maury Berman, who died recently at the age of 89. In May of 1948, Maury and his wife Flo started a hot dog stand right near the corner of Devon and Milwaukee on the northwest side of Chicago. That hot dog stand is still there. It is Super Dog. It is the best hot dog stand in the entire world. Now, I know some of you may think that's some hyperbole, or they may think I'm biased because I happen to grow up about a mile and a half from there and used to ride my bike there all the time. But no, this is no hyperbole. Super Dog is the best hot dog stand in the world. And I'm going to give you two pieces of evidence to support that claim. It got Zagat's highest rating for a hot dog stand. And if that doesn't impress you, in Patricia Schultz's 2003 book, 1,000 Places to Go Before You Die, Superdog is the only hot dog stand in there. There are six places from Chicago in that book. I've been to all of them. And let me tell you, Superdog is number one. Think about it for a second. Being in the 1,000 Places Before You Die book puts it in the category of Windsor Castle, the Grand Canyon, the Taj Mahal, Angkor Wat, and the Great Wall of China. Pretty select company for a little hot dog stand started in 1948 by Maury Berman and his wife. Here's a little feature on Superdog. The hot dog first appeared in Chicago in 1893 and was an instant hit in the city that was home to the Union Stockyards and the place where more meat was processed than anywhere else in the world. And the place with the green pickled tomato is home to the most famous hot dog in Chicago. Not a hot dog. It's a wiener. It's a red hot. No. It's Super Dog. It's the whole package. It's not just the hot dog. It's a Super Dog. It's better than the rest. There's only a Super Dog. There's not different kinds. There's only one Super Dog. It's made for us, so our recipe. They're always consistently perfect. The buns and the hot dogs are juicy, and they're always hot and well cooked. A lot of places, you don't get them that way. The Super Dog tastes the same today as it did when they first opened. But that's not the only thing they've preserved from the 1950s. We're the only drive-in left in the city of Chicago with car hop service. Many people have never seen a drive-in before. They're used to a drive through you know, like a McDonald's. They've heard about it on Happy Days or American Graffiti or something, but they haven't experienced it, and this is the only place that they can really get it. Superdog is a well-known Chicago institution, and over six decades of service has built a reputation as not just a great place to eat, but a must-see international destination. I've been coming here for 58 years, and both Beth and I fly for United, and it's the first place we go when we come in for a trip. Right <laughs> off the Kennedy to the dog. We fly to China and we wear Superdog t-shirts. Sometimes people stop us on the Great Wall and go, Superdog, I know about that. Great wieners alone don't make a place an international destination. To get a global following, you truly have to stand out. One way to accomplish that? Model two gigantic humanoid hot dogs after yourselves and stick them on top of the building. Maury thought of the 12-foot dog on the roof. Originally, super dog himself. But then he thought of the idea of putting the two of us together. They have been up there since the first day we opened. And you know, it's become a landmark. Several years ago, we took them away to be remodeled. People were getting lost because when they got to Milwaukee and Devon, the dogs weren't standing on the roof. Everyone wants to experience the world-famous super dog, but not everyone gets to. Before you step up to the counter, make sure you're well-versed in super dog etiquette. Two hot dogs. You don't order hot dogs here. They're super dogs. So you want the perfectly steamed bun. Take super dog, place it right in the bun. Golden mustard, the bright neon green relish, white chopped onions, kosher dill pickle. We're going to take our box, put that in, fresh cut fries. A lot of places use a red tomato. We don't. We use a green pickled tomato. And then people want the hot sport pepper. So that's how that's done. I'm going to take a break and go over there and get one. Okay, I'm back. Boy, that was good. Here's Mrs. Superdog, Flory Berman, talking about how Superdog started. Neither of our parents were involved, neither of our families were involved in food, and we really didn't know anything except how it tasted. Maury returned from World War II and needed a job to help get him through school. The couple built a 20 by 12 building with no heat or gas, hoping to sell enough hot dogs to get through their college years. Although Flory says only a few customers stopped by that first day, they brought in $100 the following Friday. Which was an enormous amount of money. 
considering that a super dog was 22 cents and a Coke was a dime. Now, you can't buy anything for a dime today. After three years of running their hot dog stand, only in the spring and summertime, the Bermans decided to open up shop full time. For Flory, it truly was the American dream. Because who ever thought that from that 22 by 12 building that we started in 1948, whoever thought we would still be here 63 years. And here's Maury Berman before he died talking about his philosophy of Superdog. When we began, it was our intention to serve a product that is better, a taste that is unique and exquisitely good. It is our exclusive recipe, copyrighted. Not only do we attest to the fact that it is different and great, we've got literally thousands of people in a library full of press releases that concur. No ketchup. However, catering to the customer, we will serve him ketchup, but we will not apply it. He will have to do it himself. Every customer, every time, in a manner that would make him want to return, and bring his friends with him. Exactly. The copy on the box. Maury Berman is gone, but Superdog is still there. And I don't care where you're listening to this. I don't care what state in the United States or what country across the world. You come to Chicago, you must go to Superdog. I guarantee you you'll enjoy it. And by the way, get yourself a selfie with Mr. and Mrs. Superdog, who are up on the roof of the place. We're going to move on now to Stan Cornyn, who died recently at the age of 81. Stan Cornyn was a record executive who worked for Warner and Reprise, but his fort was writing liner notes. Liner notes were the descriptive copy that was on the back of record albums, and he was the best in the world at it. In fact, in 1966, he won a Grammy for it. Great writer Mark Stein, who used to be a DJ, paid tribute to Stan Cornyn in his blog, and I'm going to read a little bit of it. Stan Cornyn died this week. I met him in the 80s when he was an exec at Warner Brothers, or as it was then, if memory serves, Warner Electra Asylum. I gush like a fangirl. Oh my God, I can't believe it. You're the best. You're the greatest. I didn't mean the best of whatever it is an executive vice president of a multinational record company does, but the best at liner notes, sleeve notes. And back in the pre-CD, pre-download days, when records came in big sleeves and the guy who wrote the notes was on the back with a star billing, and not tucked away in some small print leaflet inside the case, Stan Cornyn raised liner notes to the level of art. When I was a teenage disc jockey, I got out Strangers in the Night, intending to say something about whichever track I was going to play. And then my eye fell on Cornyn's back of the LP riff, and I thought, wow, no point competing with this guy. They were the first and last liner notes I ever read on the air. I still love it when I'm browsing old record stores, flip over the LP, and find Cornyn on the other side. Very few people can say they're the best in the world at what they do, but Stan Cornyn was. It would be a fitting tribute if the stonemasons made his gravestone with the epitaph chiseled on the back. Rest in peace, Stan. We're going to move on now to Elizabeth Bing, who died recently at the age of 100, and she is the person who is most responsible, along with Marjorie Carmel, for popularizing the Lamaze technique of childbirth here in the United States. Lamaze was started by a French obstetrician, Dr. Ferdinand Lamaze, in the 1940s, stuff that he'd observed in the Soviet Union. And Elizabeth Bing, a nice Jewish girl from Berlin, popularized it in the United States. According to PBS, she's known as the mother of Lamaze and emphasized breathing and relaxation techniques as one way of easing the pain and anxiety of delivery. She authored the book Six Practical Lessons for an Easier Childbirth in 1967. Today, an estimated quarter of American mothers-to-be and their spouses attend Lamaze classes each year. Lamaze International has about 2,000 childbirth educators located around the world. A trained physical therapist, Bing became interested in childbirth in the 50s at a time when expectant mothers were often heavily medicated during childbirth and fathers were usually absent from the delivery room. She wrote in a 1990 article about a personally pivotal moment in her career when her own mother observed one of her childbirth classes. She wrote, while my mother was watching my class, she suddenly spoke up near the end of the session and said, I wish I had someone who would have told me all about labor and delivery, and I wish they had taught me to use my body correctly. I did not know how to help myself and I wish someone had shown me how to relax. Nobody told me anything beforehand. I was frightened and helpless and very lonely. In a 2000 interview with the Journal of Perinatal Education, Bing said she was encouraged by the doctors who supported her during her initial advocacy for childbirth techniques that gave pregnant women more agency over their bodies. These doctors were prepared to stick their necks out even though there was a lot of opposition from their colleagues at the time to this crazy fad, she said. 
I think they were uneasy about the over-medication of women, and they probably had the same feeling that we had, that there must be better ways. Lamaze International's president, Robin Elise Weiss, said that Bing's continued influence in delivery rooms across the country cannot be overestimated. Even if people haven't heard her name, she said she's impacted how they give birth. Personal experience, my wife and I did Lamaze for our first kid, and we did it for all these weeks and practiced it and everything. And then we got into the delivery room, and the first thing she said is, would you stop breathing on me so hard? Sorry, dear, I had to tell that one. Oh, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. And tonight we're going to close with Gero Upremian, who died recently at the age of 70. Gero was one of the great place kickers in NFL history. Came to the NFL via Cyprus. He started out with the Detroit Lions. He didn't really know too much about football. He was a left-footed soccer-style kicker, one of the first soccer-style kickers, the prototype of the European kicker. His English was bad. He was small. He didn't wear a face mask on his helmet. He was the last guy not to wear a face mask on his helmet. That changed after Ray Nitschke hit him one day. So he was basically one of these guys that they would take shots at all the time. But he could really kick. He moved from the Lions to the Dolphins, and he was part of the great Dolphin teams of the early 70s. He won a lot of games for the Dolphins, including a couple of tight playoff games, but his reputation was made with one of the most infamous plays in Super Bowl history. Set the stage, the 1972 Dolphins went into the Super Bowl as the only undefeated team in NFL history to that point. They were led by a great defense. They had Bob Greasy as their quarterback. Paul Warfield was one of their receivers. They had Larry Zonka and Jim Kick. They had quite a team, and it was coached by Don Shula. They were going into Super Bowl VII, which was actually held in early 1973, against a tough team from Washington, coached by George Allen. The Dolphins completely outplayed the Redskins in the game. They were ahead 14 to nothing with about two minutes to go on their way to a perfect season. They had the ball deep in Redskin territory, and Don Shula decided to call on Yepremi to kick a field goal. A successful field goal would make it 17 to nothing, put the game well out of hand, and would coincidentally give them a 17-0 season. The Premian's kick was blocked, which wasn't so bad, but the ball bounced right back into his hands. At that point, he had no idea what to do with the ball. He tried to throw it, but it slipped out of his hands. It bounced off of one of the Dolphins and into the hands of the Redskins' Mike Bass. Well, there was no way Gary or Premian was going to tackle Mike Bass, and he trotted easily into the end zone for a touchdown to make the score 14-7 to and put the game in doubt for a little while. The Dolphins ultimately went on to win the game 14-7. to They held the Redskins off for the last two minutes. But Yepremian's play was played over and over again, and he was called the goat of the winning team. Here is that play in Super Bowl seven. All right, here's Yepremian on for a 42-yard field goal attempt. Earl Morrill, the holding, and this kick is blocked. Yepremian has it. <laughs> Throws a pass up for the ball. It's Mike Bass. He's running away for a touchdown. Mike Bass scores. What a cookie play! Gary Premian lost his head and tried to throw a pass. It went in the hands of Mike Pass, who scores, and they kicked the point now. The Redskins with 2:07 to go are behind by seven. Well, it didn't make him too popular with Don Shula that day, but ultimately it didn't hurt his football career. He went out to kick for another 10 season. He was a great kicker, and he actually took it in good humor, and he got all sorts of endorsements for it. He was on a memorable episode of The Odd Couple where he played Penny Marshall's date who couldn't speak English. All he could do was kick. Penny Marshall would kneel down and hold a little pillow for him as he kicked it. He also did a pretty good commercial with Raiders tough guy Dave Casper for Right Guard. I've heard Gerald Yepremian has more power than Dave Casper. More power? Him? I have new right guard power pump antiperspirant. So, I got banned base. For most people, Dave, right guard's formula has uh, more power. <laughs> For some, up to twice as much. Power against wetness. Mm -hmm. What's more, you can spray uh, twice as much banned basic and still not match the power of right guard. New right guard power pump. Don't get dressed without it. <laughs> Gary Prem was a funny guy. Well, as a final tribute, there's only one song we could play. It's a great song by Cole Porter. I couldn't decide whether to use the version by Frank Sinatra or Ethel Merman, the two best versions. I decided to go with Ethel Merman on this one. So by way of Cole Porter and Ethel Merman, this is for Gero Upremian. I get no kick in a plane Flying too high with some guy in the sky Is my idea of nothing to do I get off.